Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake in OSS. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Lux Radio Theater's presentation of Paramount's gripping screenplay, OSS, starring Alan Ladd in his original role, co-starred with a talented and lovely Veronica Lake. In introducing tonight's play, I'd like to quote from Major General William J. Donovan, who, during the war, directed the Office of Strategic Services. He says... While the characters in this motion picture are fictitious, the story is based on a composite of actual incidents in the diversified activities of the Office of Strategic Services, which conducted intelligence, special operations, and on orthodox methods of warfare in support of allied military operations. It is a tribute to the brave, resourceful men and women, living and dead, who volunteered for these dangerous assignments. In other words, tonight's play is more than thrilling entertainment. It is a glimpse into the hazardous, behind-the-lines activities of those loyal Americans who paved the way for victory, whose lives depended hour by hour on meticulous attention to the smallest detail. An agent of the OSS could not afford to look well-fed in a country living on starvation diets, well-dressed among ill-clad people, or well-groomed in a land where soap was non-existent. Behind the lines, I'm sure, a Lux complexion would have been a certain giveaway among women of the OSS, just as it's uh, a hallmark of good grooming among women in civilian life. In fact, I can think of no better countersign or password for admission to the League of Lovely Women than Lux Toilet Soap. From LTS, we take you now to OSS. Starring Alan Ladd as Martin and Veronica Lake as Ellen. Here's the curtain for Act One. It's 1943. In a colonial mansion set in the peaceful Virginia countryside, a group of men, some young, some middle-aged, are gathered for a meeting. From their looks, it could be a salesman's convention. Closer still, a get-together of college alumni. But the lesson these men are learning was never taught in any college. There's nothing superhuman about being a good intelligence agent. Yes, it takes guts, brains, and patience. But this is a new game to us. You trainees are average Americans, and the average Americans are not brought up to fight the way the enemy fights. But we can learn to become agents and saboteurs if we have to. One of these days, you'll be working in Axis territory. You'll be on the spot every minute of the day or night. Your only chance, your only chance will be to beat the enemy to the punch. Forget everything you've ever been told about fair play and sportsmanship. Forget everything, except that your country is fighting for its life. That's all for now. Radio laboratory at 10 o'clock, camera room at noon. Dismissed. <laughs> Commander Brady, sorry to drag you out this time of night, but I've just had a visitor, General Donovan. Well, your orders have come through. Operations in France, Colonel? Right. Well, when do we start, sir? Now. The job won't be finished until our troops cross the Rhine. You've got two things to do. First, get information. Second, work with the French underground and sabotage key enemy installations. Now, look at this map. These railway lines that feed this area here, around the city of Orléans. Right here is one of our priority targets. Recognize it? Yes, sir. The Corbeil Malone Tunnel. If we can knock that tunnel out, we'll paralyze the most important traffic line into Normandy. We've assigned the tunnel to Team Applejack. What's its personnel, Commander? Team Applejack, leader Rodney Gates, Army Officer, World War I. Civilian occupation, railroad supply salesman in France. Good man, mature judgment, stability, and balance. Next. John Martin, Lieutenant, junior grade, U.S. Navy. Civilian occupation, publicity man, knows France. Little on the cocky side, but he'll do after he's been knocked around a bit. Well, there's balance and brains. We need a little brawn. Bert Parker, chief petty officer, civilian occupation, sportsman, motorboat racer. Sorry, but Parker's been assigned to Germany. He's lived there. 
If he gets through, he's to lay low as a Ryan barge worker until needed. Well, we've got another muscle man named Boucher. He used to be a hockey player. Yeah, that should do it. Balance, brains, and brawn. The ideal setup. Except we'll need one more. Someone who knows the district. Someone to contact the French underground there. What about a woman? They can often get through where a man can't. Personnel in London could recruit I'd rather see if we can find one here first. Well, see that Gates, Martin, and Boucher stay put. Oh, uh, you too, Commander. I'll be needing your help in finding that girl. So this is where you live, Miss Rogers. This is it, Mr. Brady. Alone? Oh, no. With Jean-Jacques, my cat. Well, it's been very nice meeting you. Thanks for a lovely evening. You're welcome. I'm really very glad Uncle Arthur asked you to call me. Well, good night. You're not going to ask me in? It's rather late. Oh, now, wait a minute. This is my first trip to San Francisco. My plane doesn't leave until 3 a.m. You wouldn't turn me loose in a strange town at this hour. Besides, Uncle Arthur wouldn't approve of that. Well, all right, come on in. Thanks, Miss Rogers. I knew you wouldn't let me down. I can't afford a studio and an apartment, so this does for both. Like some coffee? Later, maybe. So, you're a sculptress, eh? Seems to me I told you all about that at dinner. Trying to make conversation, Mr. Brady? I'm trying to find out how good a business it is, sculpting. Financially, I mean. It's a bust, and no puns intended. You've got quite a collection here. You do all these? Yes. Recently? You're full of questions. No, not recently. Most of them in France. I studied at Fontainebleau. Oh? When was that? Two years before the occupation. Oh, too bad about the French. July 16th, 1429. Hmm? I never was much good at dates. That's the day Joan of Arc liberated France after a hundred years of occupation. Joan of Arc never ran into a panzer division. No, this time the French are finished. I'm sorry, but you don't know the French people as I do. The plain people. Their good common sense. Their stubborn pride. Their faith. Their deep faith. That's a very pretty speech. You're pretty, too. Why, in France, they even... We're, we're not in France. We're in San Francisco, and I didn't come up to talk politics. I'm not talking politics. I'm talking about the indestructible... Your kisses would be pretty, too, Miss Rogers, if you'd cooperate a little. There's the door, Mr. Brady. Uh-uh, not yet. You're getting out of here right now. I'd rather stay. I'd hate to have to fracture your skull, and I'd hate even more to smash this figurine, but if Uncle you don't... Uncle Arthur's going to be very disappointed in you. Stop that idiotic Uncle Arthur routine. I haven't spoken to that stingy old goat in ten years. He'd no more have given you my address than turn up at a board of directors meeting without his clothes. Now, just who are you, Mr. Brady, and what do you want? You're a bright girl. You're right. Uncle Arthur definitely did not ask me to look you up. You see, it's not Mr. Brady, it's Commander Brady, Office of Strategic Services. Ever hear of us? No. Then put down that figurine and relax. You and I are going to do some serious talking. Oh, uh, that kiss. Just a sort of test, Miss Rogers. Message for you, Colonel Field. Go ahead, read it. San Francisco says yes. It's signed, Brady. Good. Call the laboratory. Tell them Brady will be in for a full report on Thursday. Yes, Commander, it's already here. Take a look. That's the kind of clay a sculptor would use, is it? It's what you ordered, plastic explosive that looks, feels, and tastes like modeling clay. That's wonderful. Going into the art business? Not a bad idea. Wait a minute. Why couldn't we develop a whole line of art store merchandise? More plastic explosive to put up in tubes like uh, tubes of paint. Time pencils as, as crayons. Reels of fuse, picture wire. It could be done. Now, you're sure of this stuff? You can actually model with this explosive? Definitely. Let me use your phone. Uh, this is Commander Brady. Get me Colonel Field, please. Now, look, start turning out that clay. We'll need a lot of it. Pack it well. It'll have a long way to go. And the tubes, the picture wire? That, too. Right away. High priority. You can... Uh, Colonel Field? Brady. Applejack can go to London tomorrow. The girl? I'll wire her now. Everything set. She can join us later over there. Oh, and from now on, we're referring to Miss Rogers as Helene Dupre. Now that Helene Dupre is here with us, Team Applejack is complete. As soon as your clothing and documents are in order, you'll be leaving this hotel. You'll be leaving London. You'll be leaving England. I don't mind saying I'm scared to death. Don't worry. We all are. Well, you men, any questions? The, um, the young lady, Commander, she's, uh, she's going with us. Yes? Why? We'll come to that later, Martin. What's on your mind? Well? All right, how do we treat her? 
Because I'm a woman? That's right. Forget it. Look, it may get pretty rugged the other side of the channel. Tough to buy a cup of coffee and tough to find a place to sleep. Let's clear that up right now, Mr. Martin. I'll buy my own coffee and find my own bed. Yeah, suppose you get picked up. Some of the most successful agents in history were women. Yeah, I know. Women like uh, Mata Harry. How do you know what kind of woman I am? Well, I think you're the kind that ought to be raising a couple of kids in the Cleveland Heights. There's bound to be a lot of excitement where we're going, and I want to be sure everybody's going to keep calm. Now, wait a minute, Martin. Helene wouldn't be here in London unless we thought she qualified. Nothing personal, sir. I'm only concerned about operating successfully. I think we will. If Mr. Martin stops worrying about my sex, treat me like any other member of the team. Right. Now, you all know where you're going, and you know your objectives. The Corbet Malon Tunnel is the jackpot. The first thing to do after landing is to contact FFI headquarters at an inn called Le Cheval Noir. When you've got something to tell us, use your radio. Now, let's go over your cover-up stories. Gates? My name is Raoul Jassy, a Parisian. I used to be an automobile salesman. When the war came, the office was closed. I've been unemployed most of the time since. My health is bad. Lung trouble. I've come to stay at a farm near the city. Bad lungs, you said? I have x-rays to prove it. Here. Let me see. Uh, they're certainly bad, all right, but whose lungs are they? Mine. If I were the Gestapo, I'd have you shot. These are American-made x-rays. French x-ray plates are different. Have French ones made. Boucher? My name is Albert Bernardi. I'm an ice skating instructor. I worked winter resorts all over. Saranac Lake, Sun Valley, San Moritz. I'm looking for a man I heard was going to open a skating rink in Orleans. I can't find him, and I'm short of funds. I'll take any kind of work I can find. You're a pretty husky young fellow. Why aren't you a prisoner of war or in a labor battalion? <laughs> That's right. I forgot to tell you. Here are my papers. I'm not French. I'm Swiss. The war caught me in France, and I haven't been able to get back. Mm, that's better. Martin? My name is Philippe Martin. I lost my mother when I was eight, went to live with my aunt in the United States. Came back from military service in 1935, trained 18 months, then got a job as correspondent for American newspaper. Called back up in 39, fought at Sudan, was captured with my division. Later released by the Germans to work for them at the Renault factory. When the factory was bombed out, I was sent to Orleans to work in the railroad yard. Too glib, Martin. Otherwise, okay. <laughs> Helene? My name is Helene Dupre. My home is Norlia, where my family has lived for generations on the Routier. I'm a sculptress, graduate of Fontainebleau. Every year, my husband and I used to spend our vacations near there. He was a writer. His name was Jean. This year, I've come alone. Jean was killed in the order. A writer? I said I was a correspondent. My articles would have appeared in the United States. You can find Jean Dupree's work in the back issues of many French magazines. Oh, then Helen Dupree is real. She was my roommate at Fontainebleau. We were inseparable. People used to call us the sisters. Oh, uh, what happens if you run into her? I won't. She's missing. This is her last letter. She says, goodbye, my sister. It will be evening soon, and I shall walk down to the beach and out onto the surf. Thinking of you, thinking of Jean. Shall I go on? No, I, I'm sorry. Well, I suggest you all go to your rooms now and get some sleep. Chances are you'll leave tomorrow night. You will be dropped, of course, by parachute. I'll see you in the morning. I've just been talking to the pilot. How do you feel, Helene? Oh, just fine. No, is that what the pilot wanted to find out? When do we jump? We just flew over our destination. There should have been a signal from the ground. Well, there wasn't any. Hey, that means there'll be no FFI to meet us. That's right. You want to turn back? I say we should jump blind. Any objections? No, no sir. No, let's jump. Good. We'll jump blind, then. Oh, our pilot assures me our plane has been spotted by the Nazis. We expected that, didn't we? Yes, but that may make things a little tough down below since there's no one to meet us. Still want to jump? Let's yes, go. Sir. Okay, I'll tell the pilot to run us in. Counterintelligence for you on the telephone here, Colonel. Oh, thank you. Hello, Master speaking. There's a lone unidentified plane over your area. Strong formation of British planes was reported earlier. This one may be a Stigler or it may be parachutists. Mm. I suggest that the area be covered immediately. Yeah. Geisman. Yeah, here, Colonel. Possibility of parachutists in this area. Watch that in Le Cheval Noir. They have been rendezvousing there. Don't raid it. Only watch it. Ready to jump. Good luck, everyone. See you at the end, Helene. 
Mr. Belvoir. I'll be there, Mr. Martin. All right, start jumping. In just a moment, we'll continue with the second act of OSS, starring Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake. Meanwhile, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter, looking mighty pleased about something, too. I guess it's the movie I saw this afternoon, Mr. Keeley. You can't beat a good Western. There's such a lot of fun. Sounds as though you saw that new Republic picture. That's it, Plainsman and the Lady, a real thriller diller starring William Elliott, Vera Ralston, and Gail Patrick. I've seen Bill Elliott in dozens of hard-riding films, Libby. But I always thought of Vera Ralston as an ice skating star. Oh, she is, and was once Olympic skating champion. But in Plainsman and the Lady, she again proves herself a fine dramatic actress. Vera's had quite an exciting career, you know. She escaped from her native Czechoslovakia on the very last plane before the borders were closed. Mm, that was exciting. Mm -hmm. But the real thrill of a lifetime, she says, was getting her American citizenship papers last flag day. Well, this country has gained a stunning new citizen. Vera's a real beauty. Oh, she is that, Mr. Keeley. She's one of the most photographed girls at Republic. And the studio says she just can't take a poor picture. I don't wonder, Libby. How could anyone miss with a complexion like Vera Ralston's? <laughs> Mr. Kennedy, you're certainly a man with a single-track mind. When it comes to lovely Lux complexions, I admit it. Well, you're quite right about Vera Ralston's. She uses Lux toilet soap every day. She told me active lather facials with Lux toilet soap are a wonderful aid to beauty. They leave your skin feeling fresh and smooth. Libby, won't you tell the ladies in our audience how Vera Ralston takes her Lux Soap Facial? Well, here's what she does, and it's very simple and quickly done. Smooths on lots of the creamy Lux Soap lather and works it in thoroughly. Rinses, first with warm water, followed with a splash of cold. Then she takes a soft towel and pats her skin ever so gently to dry. And that's all there is to a Lux Soap Beauty Facial. And Mr. Kennedy, screen stars find it a wonderfully effective care. You're absolutely right, Libby. We know from actual tests that Lux Toilet Soap facials make skin lovelier. These tests were made by skin specialists, and they showed improvement in a short time in three out of four cases. Hollywood stars just have to have a complexion care that works. And that's why Lux Toilet Soap is the favorite beauty soap of nine out of ten screen stars, the loveliest women in the world. Mr. Keeley returns to the microphone. We continue with Act Two of OSS, starring Alan Ladd as Martin and Veronica Lake as Ellen. <laughs> Nearly three days have passed since Team Applejack parachuted into a patch of woods near the French city of Orléans. Now in London, where he's been joined by Colonel Field, Commander Brady has received his first radio message from the saboteurs. The message has just been decoded, Colonel. Well, not too good. Gates is dead. Gates? The night they landed, he and the girl went to the inn first. Something must have gone wrong. The others found his body in the morning. And the girl? Not suspected. I've ordered Martin to take over. They're proceeding a schedule. Well, Martin's got a job in the railroad yard. Boucher's become a scissors grinder. He's rented some sort of a hovel to live in. He'll radio us from there as long as he can. Helene? She's made contact with the underground, an old man named Aubert. Has a shop that sells art supplies. She's found a studio close by. Then things should start happening. They will, sir. They will. Scissors sharpen. Knives and scissors sharpen. Knives and scissors sharpen. Can you sharpen sculpting tools? Anything, madame. Scissor sharpen, knives and scissor sharpen. How much? I have not sharpened chisels like these in a long time. I met Martin an hour ago. Oh, I can do them all right. Where? Newspaper stand, near the railroad yard. Well, how much? Ten francs each, madame. Ten, Ten? francs? Twenty car train, 6 a.m. tomorrow. That's ridiculous. Oh, well, man must live. But where? Le Mans. All right, here. Thank you, madame. I will sharpen them like new. Ten francs each. Outrageous. Hello? Hello? Yes, this is Colonel Field. What time? Confirmed? Fine. Yes, Brady's with me now. Hope to have another job for you very soon. That was British Air Intelligence, Brady. Well, Applejack's in business. 
The bombers got the train at Le Mans this morning. Completely destroyed. Any other news from Martin? A little. Helene's rounded up some FFI. They're all meeting tomorrow afternoon in Aubert's art shop. Come in, madame, monsieur. These two men are my friends, papa. Monsieur Martin, monsieur Boucher. Your, uh, your people here, Aubert? They are here. How many? Reynal Lefebvre and Madame Riot. They are in back of the shop. The military patrol saw us come in. We're apt to have visitors. If we do, just remember we're here to listen to Madame Dupree's lecture on art. My friends, no, monsieur. Come, this way. There are some important targets the Air Force can't seem to get at, especially the Corbe Malon tunnel. What about it, Reynal? That's the closed military area. Every approach is guarded. We tried again last week. We've got to keep trying. It's a must. Uh, what about the bridge of Rostand? That's Lefebvre's group. Who takes the Chambon repair shops? I will. Fine, we have the explosives here for you. I have already made yours up, Monsieur Reynal. Little sack smart modeling clay, plastic explosives. Madame Riot, you will get tubes of paint. They will be ready for... Who's that? The patrol? Wait a moment. I have to open the door. It's Colonel Meister. You'll continue with your art lecture, Madame Dupree. As I was saying, the so-called new trend in art is actually a very old one. We know to return to the classic form, but with a certain utilization of... Colonel Meister! Ah, good Our afternoon. Must be the creation of a <laughs> I am fortunate to find you here. A little Sunday afternoon discussion, Colonel. Naturally, if I can be of any assistance... I am quite sure you can help me. But first, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to listen to the young lady. We are honored, Colonel. We must avoid the decadent spiritual attitude of a man like Magdaliani. The degenerate impressionism of, uh, uh... Of César? Of course. If I may digress, the Colonel has brought up a most interesting Close point. the door, Aubert. No need Those to disturb the discussion. Those readily understand the absolute... Well, Aubert, what do I see under the counter? New tubes of paint, huh? Yes, Colonel. Ah, let me see. Cerulean, my favorite blue. What about the other colors? I'm sorry, but... Oh, no, 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 no. I won't bother. I have no time for painting. Sketching is all I can do these days. Oh, there. That uh, young woman in there. An unusually gifted sculptress. Oh, may I meet her? But of course. Madame Dupre, if you have a moment, please. Excuse me. Yes, monsieur. Madame Dupre, may I present... A meister, madame. Paul Meister. Uh, the colonel sketches. <laughs> Merely impressions. Oh, Aubert, I uh, need another pad. I am sure I have one somewhere. Uh, Madame must permit me to see her work. But there's nothing of mine here, Colonel. At your studios, then? I have my car. Really, I, I, I haven't a thing worth seeing at the moment. <laughs> uh, Madame's modesty becomes her. I shall make the usual allowances. Well, very <laughs> well, then. Uh, my apologies to your friends, Aubert. And I will pick up my pad later. Very nice studio, madame. Excellent light. Your husband shares it with you? I'm a widow, Colonel. But, well, I have been going with another man. Mm, I'm sorry. A Frenchman in the city here? He's away. He's an engineer. Oh, the Normandy fortifications? He never tells me, Colonel. This statue here is lovely. It's like yourself. You're very kind. Amazing technique for one so young. Your hand, madame. Remarkably feminine for this kind of work. If the colonel would care for some tea, and your perhaps... pulse. It's quite irregular. Could I be responsible for that? You're very discerning. So? And you are an incredible woman, my dear. Beauty and talent are rarely combined in a single individual. I confess I find it difficult to believe that these works of art here are yours, or that you are what you say you are. May I prove it? How? Sit down. I'd like you to pose for me. Oh? <laughs> that, that may take several sittings. Several. <laughs> I'm delighted, madame. Delighted. Perhaps when it's finished, you'll believe me. <laughs> Perhaps. Your head. A little more to the side, please. That's it. Meister's been coming here to your studio every day now for two weeks. Now, what have we got? Nothing except a pretty fair likeness of his head. I need more time, Martin. Bertie's raising the roof. He wants that Corbe Mellon tunnel destroyed now. As soon as it is, we go back to London. And believe me, I'm ready to go back. I'm not. 
Why are you out of blind alley with Meister? He hasn't told you a thing. Break it off with him. Meister's my department. Don't overestimate yourself. He's dangerous. You don't have much confidence in me, do you? I'd feel the same about any girl I was working with. I thought we'd settled that. No special consideration for anyone. You're not a man and I'm not a woman. We're weapons. But you could stop worrying about Meister. He's leaving town. Yeah, where's he going? I don't know. When? Tomorrow afternoon. There's a troop train leaving for Normandy tomorrow afternoon. It'll pass through the tunnel. Well, Helene, how long would it take you to duplicate this head you've made? Exact duplicate made out of our plastic explosive clay. Tomorrow noon. Could you get Meister to... to, uh... Well, I mean... Ah, forget it. I could get him to take me with him on the train? I said forget it. Helene, it's Paul. Meister. Just a minute. Let him in. I'll wait in the kitchen. Well, I, I had to come early, my dear. Staff meeting. I should be there now. Then you won't sit for me. I came only to say goodbye. Will you miss me, Helene? Paul. Paul, take me with you. Oh, I'm afraid it's impossible. Not for an officer of your importance. Oh, I suppose it could be arranged, but... Please, Paul, please. Helene, darling, you are not deceiving me. I know why you want to come with me. I have known how matters stood since the day I met you. Have you? Your engineer. You are trying to get to him in Normandy. You're too clever for me, Paul. <laughs> and you are too unscrupulous for me, Helene. All right, all right, you may come with me. Thank you, Paul. After all, our little masterpiece is still incomplete. Bring it with you. Pleasant journey together, a weekend perhaps to finish it, and then, my dear girl, go with my blessing. Is that satisfactory? Oh, yes. Good. Be ready to leave early in the afternoon. My driver will take you to our compartment on the train. Auf Wiedersehen, Helen. I heard what he said. All right, get to work on the duplicate right away. Explosive clay will require a fuse, and I don't know how to set one. Oh, will bring a fuse here. He'll set it. How will you pack it for travel? A wooden box, I suppose. Just make sure you'll be able to open it quickly. Light the fuse when the train stops in the tunnel. You're sure it will stop? I'll see that it does. Reynald can give me a railroad inspector's pass. The train takes on water a few miles east of the tunnel. I'll get on then. As for getting off, we'll both have to take our chances. Of course. Good luck, Martin. Yeah, thanks, sir. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow at the tunnel. What? Never mind, get to work. You're the engineer? Yes. What are you doing here? Just came aboard. Inspector Martin, check ride. Inspection. What do you expect of this piece of junk? Never mind that, you're late. You should have passed the Corbet Mallon Tunnel at 326. We'll pass it in five minutes. All right, then slow down. He's got a gun. Huh? I said slow down. Why are you doing this, monsieur? For France. Now jump, both of you. Paul, the train stopped. What's the matter? Hmm? Oh, it's nothing. It seems very strange stopping in a tunnel. <laughs> it makes our journey together longer. Paul, I'm worried. Please go and ask someone. Oh, no, 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 later. But I'm really frightened. Please, Paul. <sighs> All right. Corporal, where are you? Martin. Don't ask questions. Hand me that box. The fuse is lit. Good. I'll set it by the track. Here. Be right back. Climb out of the window. Hey, open the door. What's the matter? Climb out, do you hear? You've still got a chance. Who is that talking? Hello? Hurry. Corporal, break this door down. Ah. She is gone. The window. A man and woman, her colonel. There, the mouth of the tunnel. You, God! Stop those people! Fire! That bomb! There's a fuse burning! Stop those people! Stop them! Come in, Brady. Well? The report's confirmed by aerial reconnaissance, colonel. The tunnel's destroyed. That's great. Yes. Except there's been no word since from Team Applejack. I know. Get a message through to Team Sombrero. Tell them to stand by to take over Applejack's assignments. Martin, Boucher, the girl, they're either dead, Brady, or captured. Elaine. Elaine. Here. This way. 
I should have been back long ago. Sorry, I got lost. It's pretty dark in those woods at night. That's the only reason we're alive. Night and a place to hide. I, uh, I found Boucher. He couldn't get a car. Mice is alive and he closed in too fast. He can't stay here. I know. I sent Boucher on to Dijon. If you can get to a radio, you'll contact Freddy and have him send a plane in to pick us up. When, where, I don't know. We'll meet Boucher at the park in Dijon tomorrow. How will we get there? The highway's full of refugees. We'll have to lose ourselves among them. It's safer if we travel alone. No, you're in pretty bad shape. I'll manage. Oh, now, look. You look. We almost failed in the tunnel because you came back for me. Never come back for me again. Do you understand? Never come back. Okay. Can you find the highway? Yes. We we'll park in Dijon tomorrow. It's all right. You can sit down. Hello. Hello. Where's Boucher? We've had some luck. He found some FFI. They're getting us jobs at the airport. Did he find a radio? No, not yet. We've got to be careful. My sister's boys will be beating down our necks. Do you have any money? I haven't eaten since yesterday. A little. <laughs> we'll find a restaurant. Those men. Uh, what? Don't look. Two of them. They're watching us. Start smiling. That's better. I'm uh, going to kiss you. Sweetheart, it's a park bench. That may convince them. Too bad, Martin. They're still watching. Come on, we better go. Oh, some more luck, a booth near the door. Just get me something to Sit eat. Sit tight, company's coming. One of those men in the park. Well, good evening. May I join you? Thank you. I'm sorry, but there must be some mistake. Mistake, Monsieur Martin and Madame Dupre? You're quite wrong, Monsieur. I think not. I am a Amadeus Brink, Gestapo. Oh, in case you are armed, Monsieur, don't forget my colleague, Herr Onswold, he is close by. That was fine work, that tunnel job of yours. Uh, what are you talking about? These papers, Monsieur. A full report of your activities. They just arrived in headquarters. Would you catch or read them? This is outrageous. You intrude upon Madame us. Madame would prefer to discuss the matter at headquarters? Uh, what do you mean, prefer? Fortunately, I had access to these papers before any of the others saw them. Well, what do you want from us? What I want from you isn't the question. What do you want from me? No, very sensible man, Herr Brink. His side is going to lose the war, and being a practical man, he uh, looks to the future. I could be very useful to you. I have access, for instance, to the weekly Dijon Berlin military pouch and the couriers, my cousin. Uh, and what's your price? Immunity? That goes without saying. A small weekly payment and 50,000 American dollars deposited in my account in the Bank of Switzerland. Maybe we can do business. I was so sure we could. You'll have to get us a radio. Oddly enough, I have another cousin who might be persuaded to lend you one for uh, 20,000 francs. Hmm. We'll be short of funds until we contact our principals. Until then, only too glad to accommodate you. At a fair rate of interest, of course, shall we say 15%? Well, I will leave you to think things over. Till tomorrow, then, at the same time, here. Oh, Herr Onsfeld, just refugees. A couple madly in love with each other. You believe him? There's no choice, I have to. And we were going back to London. Frank is on the level. We don't dare leave. If he isn't, we'll get what Gates got. Oh, Elaine, I'm... I'm sorry. For what? Oh, the way I snap at you most of the time, the way I... Aren't you forgetting something? Yeah, 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 sure I am. Treat you like any other member of the team. That's what you want, isn't it? Yes, Martin, that's what I want. Someday, maybe, if we ever... Skip it. Here, uh, here's the menu. It may be our last meal. Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. (laughs) 
In a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of OSS, starring Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake. In Hollywood, it's news when an actress gets a studio contract without having to take a screen test. It happened, though, to our lovely young guest of the evening, Miss Lucille Barclay. How does it feel to be a Paramount star at Lucille? I still can't believe it, Mr. Keeley. You see, I'd come to Hollywood for a summer vacation. The vacation turned into a full-time job when a talent scout for Paramount saw me and signed me up. Had you always been interested in an acting career? Oh, yes. Back in New York State, where I lived, I was a member of the Rochester Community Theater. Later, I studied dramatics in New York. And all to good purpose, it appears. Oh, I was very lucky. But for real achievement, Mr. Keeley, I nominate Joan Caulfield. I visited the set when Paramount was filming their big Technicolor production, Blue Skies, and, well, I had a chance to meet her. Just think. In Blue Skies, she's co-starred with Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire. You're right. That is a success story. Joan deserves it, though. She's exceptionally talented. And besides, she's about as photogenic as a girl can be. Lovely features and a truly flawless complexion. Well, Lucille, we're proud of the fact that Joan Caulfield is a Lux girl. So she told me, Mr. Keeley, and I wasn't a bit surprised. I've used Lux toilet soap myself a long time, and I think it's tops. Many famous stars agree with you there, Miss Barkley. And if I may say so, Mr. Kennedy, lots of ambitious young starlets... Every girl in pictures knows how important it is to have a nice, smooth skin for camera close-ups. Thank you, Miss Barkley. We're glad that so many charming women everywhere depend on daily Lux Soap care. It's a fact that active lather facials in a short time give skin fresh new beauty. Now, here's a suggestion to the ladies in our audience. If you haven't tried Lux Toilet Soap as yet, why not see what this gentle care can do for your own precious complexion? Remember... Lux Toilet Soap is Hollywood's own beauty soap. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Act three of OSS, starring Alan Ladd as Martin and Veronica Lake as Ellen. For a month now, OSS headquarters in London has been receiving amazing information from Team Applejack and Allied bombers, subsequently, have been smashing Nazi installations with bewildering accuracy. Back again in London, Colonel Field gets the details from Commander Brady. It's really quite simple, Colonel. Our key man, of course, is Brink. And we're sure of Brink as long as we continue to pay off. But getting the contents of their military Boucher pouches... Boucher has a job in the washroom at the airport. He cleans hats, shines shoes. Anyway, the courier with the pouch visits Boucher every time he takes the plane for Berlin. Boucher disappears for a few minutes. He's got a camera in the laundry closet, photographs the documents on microfilm, returns them to the courier, and radios here when he's ready for our plane to pick up the film. And how do we get a plane to Dijon? Mr. Brink again. Another of his cousins owns a farm outside of town. We run a plane in at night. Too good to last. Yes, sir. I've told Applejack they can come back to London whenever they're ready. We'll be contacting them shortly, Colonel. Any message? Yes, my congratulations. Also, my urgent suggestion that they leave Dijon. They've done their job. Shine, sir? Brush your hat, sir? The courier. He was here, Boucher. This morning, Herr Brink. Good. Tell Martin our Gestapo spotters are closing in on your radio. One more message and they'll trace it to your rooming house. Suspend operations until I find another place. Oh, uh, you might shine my shoes, if you please. The film, Boucher. Here. One of the documents I photographed is red hot. The Krauts have busted a top American code, Martin. A broken It's code. all on a film. Broken code. Brady's got to know about that quick. How soon can you get to your radio? Any time now, but... Tell Brady what we've got. Tell him to get a plane in here tonight, a big one to take us out with that film. We're through. We've had enough. The radio. If I try to use the radio... Yeah, what about it? Nothing. Where will you be? And Helene? Meeting Brink in the park. It's payday. After that, we'll go out to the farm. Come out as soon as you can. We'll be in London tonight. Tonight? Yeah. Oh, uh, if you see Helene, say hello for me, will you? Details of Nazis breaking code on film. Send plane tonight. Pick up Martine and Dupre. Looks like I'll be staying. Couple of men in hallway now. Someone at Skylight, too. 
If you can contact my mother, please tell her I... Late, Brink. How long do you think we can hang around the public park? It was waiting? unavoidable. Oh, good evening, madame. My money, monsieur. Here. Oh, thank you. You, uh, you're on your way somewhere? Why? Because it is best if you are. They picked up your radio. Boucher. He is dead. Oh, I warned him. Dead? He... he didn't tell me you warned him. Did he get through to London? I think so. He was on the air when it happened. Oh, uh, we have a new chief here. He has been inquiring about you. Colonel Meister. Meister? Here? Yes, definitely. It would be necessary for me to put your record and description back in the file. Oh, uh, wherever it is you are going, if you would care to rent a car... All right, where is it? That one across the street. Shall we say 10,000 francs? I'll give you eight. I am a reasonable man. 8,000. Good night. Good night. Herr Brink. Oh, oh, Herr Answald. Isn't that your car I just saw? Who was driving it? My, my car? Yes, the man and girl. They looked strangely like the couple Colonel Meister just described to me. What couple? The Colonel is very anxious to see you, Herr Brink, my trusted colleague. I... I... I don't suppose we could talk in purely business terms, Herr Arnsvold. Uh, shall we say a hundred thousand francs? <laughs> no, I suppose not. Come along. Pity. I was always such a reasonable man. <laughs> Look at it come across the field. I never thought an aeroplane could be so beautiful. Oh, London will be there in two hours, honey. Boucher didn't die for nothing. He got the message through or the plane wouldn't be here. The door's opening. Come on. Martin! Helene! Commander Brady! Hey, what are you doing here? Are we glad to see you? I wish I was good at making congratulatory speeches. Oh, skip it. Let's get out of here. Here's your film. Great work. Where's Boucher? We... we lost him. When? Early tonight. But what happened? I'll tell you on the plane. Huh? Uh, Martin... I'm here because I have something to ask you. We're only half a jump ahead of the Gestapo. Can't we talk about it later? I'm afraid not. The Nazis are licked, Martin. They're falling back to the Rhine. Well, that's fine. That's fine. But what's it got to do with me? I'd like you to do one more job. Another job? Some time ago, we put a man into Germany posing as a barge worker on the Rhine. The sector he was assigned to has been selected for one of our crossings. If he's still alive, he'll have invaluable information on troop dispositions and fortifications. I, I, I don't get it. There's no way for him to get the information to us. We need somebody to go in there and contact him and send it out on a ground air radio. I brought one with me. And how long do you think we can live like this with our stomachs turning over every time a foot falls or a door opens? You've got plenty of other people working for you. Why do you have to pick on me? Because you're the only available agent who'd recognize our man, the only agent he would recognize. You remember Parker? Yeah, sure, I remember Parker. So what? I'm no hero. I don't want to volunteer for anything. I want my identity back. Don't you suppose Parker wants his identity back? If you want me to take that assignment, you've got to order me to take it. Then it's an order. Okay. What was that I said, Elaine? Uh, London in two hours? <laughs> Will you be there when I get back? When we go, we go together. You're going now with the commander. That's up to him, isn't it? Mice is catching up with us. How much longer do you think our luck can hold out? Gates, Boucher, we're next. Go on back to England. I'll handle this deal alone. We've worked well together. Two agents are better than one. It doubles your chances. He's right, Martin. As long as she's offered to stay, that's it. You'd, uh, you'd better get that plane out of here. You are to make your way to Strasbourg. Here, instructions and directions. Burn them when memorized. You'll meet up with the Madame Prideau. She has a place in the country. She and her grandchild. You'll work from there. Good luck, Helene. Good luck, Martin. Uh, good luck. What does that mean, sir? News from Martin, Colonel Field. They're at the Frito Farm. Any word about Parker? Nothing yet, sir. How is Martin getting to us? Ground air radio. We send a plane over his area. Martin talks to the pilot. They've had contact every day now for about a week. Just don't ease up on him. He's got to locate Parker. More bombers, Madame Prideau. But there are bombers. Don't be frightened, Giraud. I'm not frightened, Mademoiselle. In the village this morning, German soldiers all over, stealing everything. They may come here. 
They're retreating. They may. But these potatoes they will not find. And we will have these potatoes planted before the spring is out. Who's to plant potatoes, Grandmère? Our men will come back, Chirac. Always the men come back home. Monsieur Martin has gone to the orchard again. He's talking to the med of an airplane. I'd feel better if he didn't have to go so far from the house. Maybe he can talk to our men, too. Maybe he can tell them when it's safe to come home. Listen, there's a truck on the road. Germans, Chirac. The potatoes, hide them in the cellar. I can see them. They're turning in here. Monsieur Martin! He... he will see the truck. You can trust the boy and me, Helene. We are accustomed by now to receiving a bush. They will learn nothing. Can you hear me up there? Can you hear me? Slower, pal. More distinctly. We're recording this, you know. I said the Nazis are pouring across the Rhine. Bridges, boats, barges, anything that'll float. What about Parker? No sign of him. We've been down to the docks every day. Most of the barge ran out when our plane started strafing. If Parker stayed on, we might have shot him up ourselves. Wait a minute. You expecting a truck? No, what are you talking about? Your house. The truck just pulled up. Troops. You better duck, Martin. You got a gun? Yes, but... Take care of yourself. We'll be back at 100. Stand back against the wall. All of you. Martin, behind you, look out. <coughs> Leave them to me. Another, and another. Throw this vine into the barn. So, there were no men here, mademoiselle. Hey, you look frightened. Do soldiers frighten you? Well, then we will leave these soldiers. Schweigler. Jawohl, Herr Lieutenant. Mademoiselle and I will be in the other room. We will not wish to be disturbed. <laughs> Sorry if I gave you a scare. You're Helene Dupre, aren't you? How did you... No time for questions. I'm Parker. Martin recognized me. That's why I didn't shoot. I heard him, but I had to. I've seen you both down at the docks, but I never was able to get to you. That's why I got this uniform filling with those drunks inside. Now, I've got to talk fast, so listen carefully. The Krauts are heading for the East Bank. I have their troop dispositions down cold. Can you get them out? Martin has an air ground radio. He keeps it buried in the orchard. Good. I'll get rid of these troops inside, but I'll have to go with them. So it's up to you and Martin to get this information through. Go ahead. All right. It's about five miles between Flettersburg and Trubin with nothing but a few patrols between. That's just one of the weak spots. There's another just north of Laysen. If our troops cross at these spots, we'll save thousands of lives. Now repeat after me. The 146 Panzer Division in reserve near Broheim. The 146 Panzer Division in reserve near Broheim. The 122nd Grenadiers just west of Lindstein. The 122nd Grenadiers just west of Lindstein. The Infantry Division due south. about 10 minutes ago. Parker had to go with them. Martin, are you up to talking? I'm, I'm okay. What did Parker tell you? I'll write it all down for you. If it gets through on time, thousands of lives can be saved and our job should be over. When will the plane be here? One o'clock. What time is it now? 12.30. Think you can do it? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Start writing. Madame, Girard. Yes, mademoiselle. Get some water. I wish I could do more for you. Your head, it's still bleeding. Don't worry about me. Just, just put it down on paper. Here. This is it, Martin. Everything written down. I'll come back as soon as I've contacted the planes. You will be leaving us then? Yes. Where you go, you will be together. We'll be together. We'll be together from now on. Open up here. Open up. Grandmère, who can you see? Of course, there are. Two soldiers and an officer. Open Quick up, now, I say. hide in the kitchen. If they make trouble, Mademoiselle says to find Monsieur Martin. Warn him. She's going to the door now, so hurry. I listen, Grandmère. Open this door. I'll warn him if need be. Yes? Sorry to intrude at this hour. Helene. Well. We never had our little weekend in Normandy, did we? That's a great pity. You have nothing to say. Sure you remember me, Meister, Paul Meister? I remember you very well. You are alone here? I am here, monsieur. I refer to Martine. Then I am quite alone. Unfortunately, we can't spend too much time finding out if you are telling the truth. Sergeant, take the old woman to the car. And the girl, Herr Colonel? Wait outside. I will deal with her. Madame, come. 
Elaine Dupre. I still find you a remarkably attractive woman. I can almost forgive myself. Myself, not you, my dear. Then let's get this over with. All I ask is that I be taken quickly to wherever people like myself are dealt with. Not yet. I find this reunion curiously satisfying. At last, Helene. At last. Monsieur Martin! Monsieur! Gerard, what's the matter? The woman, monsieur, they're taking them away. I heard him. Who? He said his name was Maestro. Oh, don't let them take them, monsieur, please. Who is with him? Only two others. Soldiers, but hurry. She knows I went for you. Please come, please. The plane up there. I've got to contact You could do it later. Never come back for me again. Thousands of lives will be saved. Never come back. Thousands of lives. I can't, boy, I can't. Never thought you would be afraid. Never. Gerard, listen, listen. Are you down there, Applejack? Apple yeah, Jack. yeah, yeah, I'm here. Anything wrong? No, nothing. And shoot. Record us on. 146 Panzer Division Reserve near Brunheim. 122nd Grenadiers just west of Lynchstein. Lynchstein! Slow down! The 8th Infantry Division south of Robert Canal. You're losing range, Martin. And slower! Robert Canal! R O B U R G. That's better. What's your rush? 31st Engineers at Lingren. 31st at Lingren. The 18th SS Division around Horst and Steinbrook. Oh, let's have that last again. I want a clean recording. Please, I've got to get back. With news like this, so do we, pal. Repeat. The 18th SS Division around Horst and Steinbrook. The 52nd Infantry east of Freihoff, north of the highway. Just once more and we'll have it. 18th Division around Horst and Steinbrook. 52nd Infantry east of Freihoff, north of the highway. That's it until the park is okay as of a few hours ago. It's well going, Martin. Sorry to leave you, but i got to get this back to headquarters. Look at them come, Martin. Trucks and jeeps, planes and tanks. Soldiers. Our soldiers, Martin. Crossing the Rhine. Yes, sir. Job's almost finished. Thanks, Martin. Don't thank me. Thank them, the ones who didn't live to see this. Gates, Boucher, Elaine. Tell me about it, Commander. I... I didn't even know her real name. Rogers. Ellen Rogers. Ellen. Where was she born? Uh, I don't recall, but I can find out for you if you'd like. No, it... It doesn't matter. It was somewhere back home. Like... Like the town I came from. The same town, maybe. Yeah, she, she might even have lived just around the corner. Well-deserved applause for an exciting performance by our two stars, Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake. And here they are, back at the footlights for the curtain call. Well, one of the real stars of tonight's play, Bill, was William Donovan, whom you've mentioned in your introduction. Yes, he was head of the OSS in real life. Didn't you make a picture on the career of General, General Donovan, Mr. Keeley? That's right, Veronica. The Fighting 69th, which, of course, was late in World War I. And made a great movie, incidentally. Speaking of pictures, Alan, I understand that since yours were released in continental Europe, you've become the number one box office hit over there. And to think they had to wait six years before seeing Alan on the screen. Not to mention you too, Veronica. <laughs> That's right, Alan. You two have been together in so many pictures. I, I sort of missed Veronica in your latest Paramount production, Two Years Before the Mass. Yeah, I missed her too, Bill, but we're going back together again when we start shooting Saigon out of dear old Paramount. Well, that's good news for Ladd and Lake fans. By the way, Veronica, what happened to that famous over-the-eye hairdo? Well, I thought it was about time to see how the other half of the world lived, Mr. Keeley. <laughs> hey, uh, how long did you wear your hair like that, Veronica? How long? 
Oh, about 24 inches. <laughs> well, <laughs> confidentially, Veronica, I like your present hairdo even better. For one very important reason. What's that, Mr. Keeley? It doesn't hide any of that lovely Lux complexion. Well, it's certainly not hard to help keep your complexion lovely with Lux Toilet Soap Care. I always use it. And it's plain to see that that loyalty is well rewarded. Say, uh, what are you presenting here next Monday night, Bill? Uh, next week, we're proud to bring our audience for a second time this season, two of Hollywood's top artists and one of the most famous acting teams in motion picture history, Greer Gossen and Walter Pidgeon. They appear in their original screen roles in metro goldwyn Mayer's epic drama, Mrs. Parkington, the story of a man who ruled a dynasty with daring and ruthlessness, and a woman who ruled a man with love alone. A great cast, a great play, Bill. Congratulations. And good night. Good, good night, night, and thanks to both of you. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon in Mrs. Parkington. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. The main cause of the current soap shortage is the worldwide scarcity of fats and oils. Industrial fats are needed also in the manufacture of many other essential household goods. So please continue to save used kitchen fats. Your butcher will pay you for every pound you turn in. Secretary of Agriculture Clinton P. Anderson says it is urgently important that American women keep on saving and turning in used fats, taking advantage of larger meat supplies to step up their fat salvage. Heard in our cast tonight were Gail Gordon as Brady, Joseph Kearns as Meister, and Richard Benedict as Boucher, Charles Seal, Norman Field, Jay Novello, Rolf Sedan, Noreen Gamil, Ed Emerson, George Neese, Howard Jeffrey, Henry Rowland, George Sorrell, Truda Marson, and Robert Conte. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Mrs. Parkington with Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon. Rely on Spry, S-P-R-Y. Yes, it's Spry for lighter, finer, richer flavored cakes every time. Make that next cake with pure, all-vegetable Spry, the shortening with the magic cake-making secret. Hear him say, Mmm, wonderful. The reason why, S-P-R-Y. For all you bake and fry, rely on Spry. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Mrs. Parkington with Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon. And why not tune in a half hour early to hear Joan Davis over most of these stations? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>